They're going to teach us 10 ways to triple your business. I like the simple word in there as well. Um, as I shared in team meeting, um, they are going to be expanding into our market center. So if you are looking uh, to join with an expansion network, definitely hang after and connect with them. Um, and also, if you are an expansionist yourself or thinking about it, hang after a mastermind a little bit, okay? We create connections. Um, we bring in top talent for you to know, um, have relationships with so that we can all grow our businesses together. Um, and without further ado, you guys take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank yeah. you. All right, so I'm going to you guys, or all of you, actually. So how long have you guys been in the business? I know a couple of you said three years, right? Last few months. Very new, so very new. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right, you guys are coming. We need Carol up here. I've spent most of my career, to be honest, um, I've been in Pennsylvania. I've got licensed on the line of and I love construction. So I spent most of my career doing that. But the last 10 years, exclusively in the Wonderful. I do my. I love dentists. I like them equally well. I love it. A lot of, a lot of knowledge. Bill, yeah. how long? Well, like 10 years in the rest of the 10 years. Okay. 2005. Okay. But the past 10 years. So we've got a great little mix here. So some of these things you guys may have heard before in KW over the years, right? So nothing that we're going to say today is necessarily some. Um, Completely. Right. Just uh just some random life changing thing. It's the actions that take place that are gonna separate you from, right? That's what's gonna separate you from having success or not as much success, right? So it's gonna be on the action. So we want to be very clear on what these actions are today. And since we go to a lot of classes and without implementation, it's just their name. So if I can bring anything about you today, it's helping you see which parts to take action on and how to leave here today with exactly what needs to happen for you to go forward. Okay. Just hit the metal. Just tap it. Oh. No. The drop down. Learning. So technology has not always <laughs> been my uh, special. Okay. So I'm Wallace Myers. Been in real estate since 2015. So seven years. Just made seven years. Um, I got in real estate at 18 years old. Been in high school before that. Two classes. Did any of you guys ever work for your parents before? Okay, so I did. If you ever work for your parents, you learn very quickly of all the things you don't want to do, and you try to get by an excuse to not have to go work with them. Okay, so I went. I was like, I'm gonna go to this real estate class. I can get out of work, and uh, that led me. Graduated high school that May. Got into real estate that July. Um, went to work very. I started working very hard. Not always very smart. Got successful super fast and could have made some much different decisions. I could take a whole class on what not to do. So I can teach you guys today how to work smarter and get some of these things quicker. Um, that'd be really be, uh, that'd make me very happy, right? To provide some of those things I wish I would have known my story. So fast forward, um, started, started out as a solo agent, started making calls, making connections. Um, didn't really have a whole plan in place, just started doing that one action. From there, it led to, my first year, I only had two closings. The following, however, that January, so first six months from July to December, only two closings. That following January, I had about 12 listings. From there, it just took off, and every year just grew and grew. Eventually, started a team. Last year, our team did over 450 transactions. And so, seven years in, well, a little less than that, six and a half years in, then we did a little, little over 450 transactions. Um, started looking for opportunities to grow. And Aaron Hurd, that's on the screen, ended up merging our team with him out of Portland and Oregon on May 1st. Together, we can do more. Uh, Aaron has been in real estate since 07. He started as a buyer's agent on the team. He's usually teaching this class with us. So any of the parts you don't like today, it's parts you put in. <laughs> so Aaron, super cool story. I'll, I'll touch base on him really quick. That's he's amazing. He was a buyer's agent on the team in Portland. And before expansion was really a thing, he started, uh, some of you guys may have started hearing that over the years of KW about expansion. Um, they started coaching these other, other teams. It was a buyer's own team, started coaching. And so they were coaching some agents at a couple different locations. He became expansion director. Three years later, they were over seven locations where they were coaching uh, these, these, they had teams, right? And they would actually get on the call talk with Gary way back before expansion was really going around. 
And he said, well, that's expansion. It's what you do, right? So they created a regional director model and they went from, so three years in seven locations, they went from seven locations to 96 locations in 18 months, did over $18 million for expansion. So um, super happy to partner with him. And Amber here, let you tell, tell everyone who you are. I'm Amber Pendak. I have been in real estate um, for almost 20 years now across two different states. So I started in Georgia. I started as um, just doing it for myself to open the door for investing opportunities. And that gradually rolled into a traditional business model, you know? Um, and as part of that, I've been a mentor, a coach, um, productivity coach with Keller Williams for a while there, team lead, and uh, moved to Florida four years ago. And now I have joined uh, Realtor Property Group here effective July 1st. So I'm now a regional director of Florida to grow our team here. Yeah, so, super yeah. happy to have you, Amber. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> so she's the one that really kind of keeps this in line, I promise you. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mess, okay? Look like I'm all organized up here. It takes a, a, a lot of effort to do that way, a lot of uh, practice. And that's the first slide, practice. <laughs> See, so I'm not, again, yeah, hit that me all right. I don't know. You can my Oh yeah. I'm sorry. I'm skipping over the board one. Don't want to get the board part over first. Can I go with you guys? There's one board part. I'll let you love that, but it's necessary. Okay. Go with KW Red. There you go. All right. So how, who knows how much they want to make this year, next year? Throwing them out. Go ahead, Ms. Carol. Well, I'm on the team, so I like to make about 400. 400,000. All right. So, I think, well, this color is not the best. Is anyone familiar with the economic model, being with Color Williams? I know newer, you may not have run across it yet. So, like any good KW model, it starts to shape because it's supposed to be a time. I did a pretty good job this time. All right, so 400,000. Right. What's the average price point? So I know you probably might have a different price point, and when you're working it for yourself, you use your average. But I think Okay, so right, so four hundred thousand. Oh, you're not counting last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm just saying. You know, my business was all 50% last year, and we weren't accepting a lot of but that's all changing again now. So, right. Full of the so, yeah, this is definitely something you can revisit and go back. And I'm not going to go through every single number with you guys, uh, just the essence of time and respect of time. Um, so, 4,000, what's the average commission amount in your area? 3%. Three percent? Three percent? Okay, can someone, well, three times four, 12, so 12,000. 12, I know that one. Later on, I'm going to. So three percent for twelve thousand dollars. All right. If you're on a team, let's just say you're on a 50-50 model, um, you can you can divide this in half. Whatever your model is, right? You can divide it into six thousand on average. Okay. Now, how much is your your pack within Keller Williams here? And I don't want a team that could be different, but let's just say for a uh, normal tax, 27. 27. So we can take this number. If you want to make 400, let's take your cap and put it back into 427,000. Okay. Now, someone do some, some math for me. How many? Uh, 427,000 divided by 12,000. 75, 75 and a half. Three. Seven. Should be more than five. 427,000. Divided by 12,000. Oh, 35. 35. 35. Okay, I'm sorry. It's the rain. I thought you said five. I was like, that would be nice. <laughs> so uh, 35, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you wanted to have the 35 transactions. To make it simple, let's say that you had uh, one and a half, 15 listings, closed. And uh, 20 buyers, okay? It could be a 50 50, model, 50 50 model, whatever you want, right? So let's say you want to have 15 flows, right? So we know these numbers are so different. We, we ran this many times, whether it's in a different market or per person, it changes so much. 
And so let's say, so we can just use an average. And things have been different, like you know, the last year, right? So might have an average rate of the 15% fallout from under contract to close. Because to have something close, what do you first have to have it done? You have to go under contract. So 15 close, first they gotta go under contract. All right, so I'm not gonna do all the math with you, but let's say it's about an 85% from under contract to close. Getting 15% fallout. And sometimes when you're doing deal with a lot of properties, you don't try to, you know, you just help them get to something else that might fall for a little more. Sometimes when you're newer and you get so focused on that one, you kind of see they a little better. So the numbers fluctuate, right? Um, say about an 85 And these numbers you can hit with some team leader, whatever, just to kind of get some average and actually really the track. So before it goes under contract, you're talking about on the list side specifically, what do you have to have? Listing agreement signed, right? Typically. So solid with sign. Okay. Now, not everyone that you sign goes under contract. So we can say 75% of what you sign goes under contract. Lately, that's been a lot higher number. Things have been going on. Just for essence of the presentation, 75% goes under contract will be signed. I see some messages on here. I just want to make sure they can hear me. All right, guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to speak louder and more in this direction. If uh, any more problems, just let me know. So, um, she said, she said I had to talk about it's been uh, cut out. So, um, so 75% signed under contract, right? Now, before it goes signed, what has to happen? You had to have, typically you had to have an appointment, right? So, an appointment that you held, whether it was virtual, phone, or in person, right? Where I'm from, it's a lot more in person because people are living here. I know in Florida, a lot of times it's second home, they live somewhere else. So, it might be more of a virtual type of appointment. So, go from signed to held. All right, so you can say, use the same number, 75% of the appointments that you held actually went signed. Okay, and then before it's held, you had to set that appointment, right? Typically, don't you know another way? So set 75%, all right? So you got a certain, now Ms. Carol, over the years, has every appointment that you set sold? Every one that you said no, and everyone on the sales side, everyone you want to contract sold. No, right? If it did, we'd be, oh man, we'd be living on a beach, but I guess you guys already are. I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> so to get appointments set, you have to have contacts, right? So what you would see here before you get to exactly the contact part is you realize that 15 clothes on the seller side. You might have to have when you that go under contract, just doing some. Not the best math again. So 20 that goes under contract, 25 or uh, yeah, 28 that are signed, 35 that are held, and uh, you may have to set 45 just to get 15 close, right? Okay, so this is pretty good. I love it. This <laughs> place ever does this for me. I appreciate it. I'm so 34 set to get 15 close, right? So, how many seller contacts would it take? To be able to get 34 close. This is a year, 34.7. So, whatever that number might be, and that would really change it depending on lead source, how you're contacting them, your network, right? So, I'm not even going to get into that, but it may be, you know, it's going to be a lot different number. Contact voice to voice, not just that you dial, right? So, what you, what you would see, you can say 34 divided by 12 while you're at it. Four point four. Sorry. I don't know right. Two point eight. Okay. So almost you almost just round up the number. You can say I need to set three listing appointments per month, which based on actual conversions that we're tracking will lead me to 15 seller closing. Now these percentages are going to be different on the buyer side, especially on the contact. You actually may have a lower contact on this side because typically a seller conversation means that they have Talked about filling for sell by owner expire or something along those lines. If you're doing buyer contacts, that's really just any contact, right? So, completes a lot of times they're just looking at something or you're steering, whatever that might be. You're going to see a lot higher contact. However, essentially, it's going to be the same type of uh, same type of process. So, now you actually have a model. We're going to get back to this model a little bit too. So, really kind of makes it a chain, right? All right, moving forward. Oh, I'm clicking again. 
Well, and just to say that you've got this economic model, your team leader is going to have a copy of it. We went really fast, but you're going to go through and use your numbers. And I always, when I plan, plan conservative. Aim high for your goals, but when you're planning, plan conservative because you want to build in that extra effort in case you're missing your mark, right? Because you want to you want to hit that mark. So your conversion rate is, as a brand new agent and you go on a seller appointment, um, it, you know, you may be at 25% that you convert to an actual listing agreement, maybe you're 50%. So, you know, start watching that for yourself and build this plan for you and, and tweak it throughout the year. I want to run all around over here and I keep forgetting I have to stand no, close to this mic, okay? It's not good to keep me tied down, but we're going to try it today, okay? So uh, practice daily. Have any of you guys ever scripted and role played before? Okay. Rest, you need some other kind of role play? No. <laughs> anyway, don't you do that. All right. So, <laughs> so scripting and role playing. So a lot of times we talk about um if you've been in the business long a lot of times you've heard this a lot of times, but say script and role play, I sound on a body, I sound on this. So if you have any of those um thoughts that come to mind when you're thinking about it, start thinking of it as objective, right? There's objections that come up different over the years. We've seen so many things change, right? Different objections. The way interest rates are, the market, right? Different objections. So, at one point, you had to try, it was nothing maybe to get a listing. It was an object trying to get the buyers to get in. Now it's been opposite where if you get that listing, they can sell it so fast. They're like, why do I need it, right? So, the objections change, right? So, uh, practice daily. So, a couple of you guys talked about script and role play. Uh, think, another thing I like to look at is think of attorneys. Right, attorneys, some of the best in the country, thousands of dollars an hour, been in the business 20 years. When they take on a large case, what do they have? Mock juries, mock trials, because they're going over and over again on those objections so they can see the best way to overcome them. Maybe really good, however, it's always be improved, right? There's always a better way. Get that one, just get your percentage higher, right? How likely would it be to get 15 if you only had to go on 22 to make that happen? Right, that's what's important about this because you're getting those percentages. Okay, so practice daily. So Amber, you want to anything you want to mention on? I was just gonna say if we're talking about script, so script and role play, right? What are the what's happening right now in our market? Um, I'm sure you guys are talking to buyers. Are you getting that the interest rate is skyrocketing and they're freaking out? Right, so interest rate one. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good one. I've heard that a couple of times. Work. Yeah. So I have one that I, I, I heard on a house to take the rate. Refinance. Marry the house right. to take the rate. And essentially, <laughs> the, uh, the script actually we, uh, implemented with our team recently. Got it from, I didn't come up with it. I've now got to learn with KW. So many experiences where you're learning new things, you just rip off and duplicate sometimes, right? So I want to I want to wait on my interest rate. I can appreciate that by nature rate always rise and fall. The good news is you can refi a mortgage if and when rates go down. What you cannot do, however, is go back to back back in this time to buy a house at today's today's prices. Historically speaking, home values will always nearly go up, right? So bringing that logic in there really makes a difference. You get emotional with them, you know, they might get emotional and worry about it, right? So I bring the logic in, how it makes sense, how it come to that conclusion. Um, another one that I, I, I've heard a lot too is what they could afford now is a little higher, right? So they're not happy with anything they see. You guys experience that at all? It's unrealistic. That always happens, and I feel like we've been seeing that more because what they can see, so it's been kind of a while now, especially in the beginning, what they could look at six months ago was just totally different in price, right? So this isn't my dream home. I can appreciate that. By, na by nature, rates all, I'm sorry, I'm going over Ever wonder how some people afford their dream home? In many cases, it's because they bought a stepping stone home first, later sold it, and then reinvest the gains into their dream home. Most people don't buy their dream home, they trade up too. Right? So it's not a forever situation. Let's buy this one a year, two years from now. Let me list it again. Get a commission on it. Let's buy another one, right? So bring that all in there, right? And you'll notice the theme. You're taking the emotion out of it and you're applying rational thought and logic. You know, you just help ground them. Yeah, there's times to bring emotion in too, right? Like you bring in the parts of how they can see themselves in the home. There's so many different times, right? It's kind of no win. That's through experience and practicing. No win bring those two together. Um, all right. Good on practicing. I would even listen to Diana Kokos's listening video 
over and over again. I was when I was listing agent, so the only listing agent we're doing 200 something transactions a year. I would uh, go on hundreds of listing appointments, and I would still listen to Diane because listing appointment. I did because there were just certain things that would come back up and trigger me, and those situations were different. What is that? So, um, when we get to this slide, take a picture out of my email. Well, it's Cameron's email, but probably. Yeah, so, email, please tell us. And I actually have a YouTube video because I couldn't find it either. I fell it on an old jump drive. So, I uploaded it to my YouTube. I can have it. I know. I had the same struggle with So, I found this jump, jump drive somewhere that had to be the bread. I think I have it in one of my old bowls. Uh, yeah, that's what I found. Yeah. It's really, it's really, it's, yeah. yeah. Right. So I don't know if I'm supposed to have it on a YouTube channel copyright, but okay. I've got real quick. I know there's kind of a mix of experience here, but I'm just gonna say this as a reminder to myself. I'm not a script guy, okay? Because depending upon who you're talking to, you're saying to yourself, I would never say it like that to my neighbor. But it's the concept that stays the same. If you're working in your small sphere of my farm community where I go to lunch and have cocktails specifically with my clubhouse, I would never verbalize a script identically to what is written, but the concept of taking emotion out of it, let's start dealing with, it with reality. That does hold true regardless of whether you memorize the script or not. If I'm in public and standing in line at the grocery store and I can remember the script, I'd say it. They don't know me. This is a totally different conversation and sound like a script enough. But it would if I'm talking with my guys in hockey, or if I'm talking with my church people, or if I'm talking at the clubhouse, I would I don't need it. And I say that not because you shouldn't go to scripts. I say it because you gotta learn how to take the context of the script and what the goal of the script is and deliver it in an authentic way that sounds real. Because sometimes when you hear it read in these things in the morning, you go, I would never I would do that. That's not me. Right. But you know what so, else you know, with that? You know, it gives you a knowledge too. Like, for example, you know, drama, it's contracting every single day, right? When you see it, you know that he is producing Brian, you know, because he comes across yeah. as he knows it all, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Bill and the agency saying in the room, they're talking about for you guys on Zoom. Um, about how he may not say it exactly the same way when he's talking with his friends from hockey, whatever other, other it's his sphere, right? However, he can use more of the scripted way of doing it whenever he's in line and doesn't quite know someone, right? It's taking that same concept, right? So, thank uh, you for sharing. Uh, my, uh, my little trick with that that might help is um, my trick with that is to create bullet items on the key points. And you can easily memorize those bullet items, and no matter what scenario that you're in, you're able to compose a sentence or compose the concept of it in whatever voice in the scenario that you're in. I do that with listing appointments too. It's a technical thing that then you can then embed it. Embedded command? Embedded command. Yeah. Even though the structure of the sentence is different, you find the same embedded in. And I, and I say it because I, I know just for the people listening online, but just here in the room, it, it just doesn't come across authentic when you're hearing it read. And yeah. you're saying, I would never do it, but that's not the point. It's practice it, use the embedded commands, and then tweak it into your own language. And be, and that's what you're going to rehearse. Right. You know? 100%. Absolutely. Uh, so point number two, create a personal daily standard. So this is why the economic model is so important, right? Because we can create a personal daily standard, just say 20 contacts or whatever you want it to be. However, if you don't know why you're doing it, or you want to have some great goals like this Carol over there, you have to know what it's a lot easier when you have, when you know what your daily standard looks like. So we went through, through this process to see how many, um, how many appointments you had to set, right, per day. And then um, once you so once you have, um, once you know how many contacts you have to make on this, and then you have your buyer side, you can put it together. So let's say it's 10 contacts a day, 15 contacts a day, whatever that might okay, be. Okay, so I'm gonna do FaceTime with you really quickly, just so you can see um, what I'm showing you here. Oh, girl, I just started. 
thundering and lightning here. Oh. So I'm gonna show you, let's see. Um, Perfect. Probably some good stuff though. I know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so once you have your economic model established, you'll know more on what your personal data is going to be. So 10, 15 contacts a day, whatever that might be. And then also um, how many appointments you can set. So let's say your goal is to have 20 appointments set per month, right? Let's say it takes you 10 contacts a day, 20 appointments set per month, right? That would be your perfect person, your, um, your daily standard. So for me, I didn't have, mine was to make 20 contacts a day. I knew that's what it would take. So when we get to the next slide, I'm gonna have some, some help on how to make that happen. Um, yeah, for me, for one of the things I did was I knew that I was going to struggle to make those 10 contacts a day. So I set 40 a day because I knew that if I did 40, it might be 25 hours, right? And then I knew that only, you know, every once in a while, a couple times a month, I might miss it, in, right? So I set those expectations a little higher so it would all start to even out, right? Now that's the procrastinator in me that had to do that. You may not be one of those. Great for you. So. <laughs> Right, so uh, if that's the case, then you don't have to do that, right? You just got to figure out what works for you so you can create your personal daily standard. Picture yourself winning the day. That's huge. Um, asking, asking 10 people, who do you know that is looking to buy or sell, invest in real estate? That's one of the scripts, right? So not just 10 conversations. It's easy to bring up real estate into a conversation. So doing that, right? You can count that as a conversation. Um, and just on your uh, personal daily standard, you're, you're building it to your plan, but also account for how you show up every day, right? This is my start time that I start every day. This is when I do my lead generation. This is when I go on my appointments. This is when I'm going to end my day. Or when I'm going to call it and say, hey, I'm going gotta, I gotta to shift things around today because I'm gonna, we're going to leave into the next slide. So it's not just your contacts and your appointment set for the day. It encompasses everything and how you show up. 100%. Now, we'd be full if we agreed that nothing ever happened and stopped us from making our plan happen, right? Unless it's just me again. <laughs> but I just come back to the other one. What's the referral to a referral bid once a day? So it might be getting a, um, let me see, let me check a look. Yeah, it's just one referral a day. Um, so that could be uh, like um, you, some people are making contacts on um, like vendors and different things. That what they're talking about. Right. There's a lot of reciprocity that says, "Can I give?" All this week, right. So one referral a day is really just intentionally helping someone else. So if you're making if you're making your contacts and you have an opportunity to to refer your contractor or your recruiter or your CPA or you know anybody, take that opportunity and do it and just make it a goal for yourself. She added that in on me. That was on her daily standard, not mine. But I, 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 so I'm like, what? I don't remember having that. Really you are. You're building that. That's what we're here for, to connect people in, right? Having a plan B. So like I was talking about, oftentimes, got kids. They come in. They make a distraction. <laughs> Something could happen, right? So <laughs> to, to lead you away from hitting your, your goal, whether it's something that you can, that's just in your mind that's distracting you or something that's realistic, there's both, right? And sometimes we let things come in that aren't necessary and that comes with experience of knowing when it's important to stop and what's not, right? Um, but having a plan B. So I talked about how mine was to make 40 contacts coming less. I've been to so many KW events, Mega Camp Family Union, and plan B was one that I didn't really learn about until later. And I love it. So having a plan B is whenever, so any of you guys ever heard of a five o'clock protocol? So that's at the end of the day, whether it's five o'clock, three o'clock, whatever that might be. Let's say you weren't able to make your 20 contact. You weren't able to set your one appointment, whatever your daily standard was. What are you going to do to help yourself get back in line with your goal? If one day off turns into two days off and a lot of things can happen to lead you away. And then you're going to not be making 400,000. You're going to be making 200, right? Half the effort, half the result. Right. So that might be messaging 20 people on Facebook. It might be um, door knocking a neighborhood. It might be uh, sending out letters to neighborhood forming area. Whatever that is, it's not supposed to be a punishment. It's supposed to be something that can help them get back 
that one more time to work. Translates into five five o'clock happy hour somewhere, meaning you're still working. Right. You, know, you have a glass of wine or cocktail or whatever. I love it. <laughs> love it, right? Or you don't get to go to happy hour. You don't get to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Back in. Sorry. I think for the new agent agents too, if I can just take a second. For the newer agents, it's very important to have a three month checkup because when you get to September, if you haven't got your start, your goals, you know, by the your, your year ends really in September mm -hmm. because that's the last three months of the year and you should have had all your jobs by then. So, you know, September now, I'm already looking for January, February, March, December, you know, I'll look, uh, look ahead and see what I need to do. It's, it's not just, oh, whatever happens. Whoever right. Happens. The, There's a lot of things that do that. My, 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 <laughs> my son said to me when I first came to KW, his wife was a real when he started with KW. He said to me, the phone's not just going to ring. <laughs> nobody's ever calling you. Yeah, surprise. So if you're making any business, you're the one who needs to have calls. And that made a lot of sense to me. So, well, it, that's a very good point, Carol, because you know what? Anything that's happening in those last months, they're, uh, um, they're for that next year. So when you're doing your division over here and dividing by 12 yeah. months, I actually do 10 months, you know, because reality is in vacations, you're going to have, right. you know, those. If you talk about yeah. stolen money, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. 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 But this year, no, because of lack of inventory and lack of um, just sure. just the way the market was. But did I give up time? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and things that I've learned over the years, I've been through a lot of shifts and mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. that I've tried to get them. If they're given to banks. Yeah, it won't always be that and you have to keep on keeping on to make it you mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Yes, absolutely. Um very, very important to be because I've been talking about it before, right? Mm -hmm. So um I right. briefly talk on I'm oh, sorry, if you're not meeting your plan and you're just like not driven to meet it you're, what how are you gonna meet your back up like so it's just it's like most agents don't ask for, 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 for one he was asking if you if you're not good at meeting your plan how are you gonna meet your backup so for one most agents don't have that. so that's a start having a plan two it's very easy to get off your plan even if you're super organized because you start working with these customers and especially if you're newer, like you don't realize how to prioritize your time and it's, you're maybe not, you're not setting up the expectations correctly with them and you get dragged and it's super easy to get off the plan for anyone, really it is. So what happens most of the time is I'm going to start my plan tomorrow again. And then the same thing happens over and over again, right? Yeah, exactly. So what that, all, all this is, is to say that when that happens, it's something that I can do in the evening. So let's say you have children, you can't go door knock the neighborhood, right? That may be something where you can go message 25 people on Facebook or do something that can lead to that result if you got behind the phone. You got to figure out what works for you. Um, yet having that is important because it, it's, it, I know people that are very good at sticking to their plan now that probably weren't when they started. It took a while to get that. Done. 
And there are other disciplines in your work. I, I think what is important to realize is that it's your own business and it's no different from owning a school. It really is. You know, now in the summer times, I don't have to talk on my kids to school. And my husband says, why don't you stay there? You know, that question. I can, but I'm up by six o'clock in the morning. But I can do it. I do. Well, in this case, like, 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 you know, nobody's gonna follow me. I have so, so that's here, you know, and even with only the shoe store, things might happen, illness in the family or something, but then we know that you have to be there and we have to open the door for the customers, right? So if we treat it the same exact way, we will get that on track. It's like having protocols, right? I mean, this is how you show up every day. And you gotta hold yourself accountable and, and step back and be objective. Look at yourself. Would you fire me? Yeah. And if the answer is yes, you gotta do yeah. you like me to check just to add on to what he's saying? Um, for for those of us that have been around a long time, we realize that you have to structure your day. You cannot you cannot just let a Bias, for instance, they will absorb every hour of every day. Uh, yes, I do not get in my car to take to show any property unless I have a live broker agreement in place with them. Because if you know, it's like going on a listing agreement and doing it on a handshake, you don't have a listing, right? It's the same with buyers, you don't have an agreement. Find yeah. in place where they're locked into you, and you may as well just give them 50 bucks of, of gas money and go. I wish I could take a video of what she just said and embed that in so many things. You know, our team at times they go person and it doesn't work out. But taking it from a take it from a sports example, real quick like think of halftime. So there's football teams, NFL, everywhere, right? Like they have a plan that if they're X amount of points behind by halftime. They have a plan B. It's a risky move. It's something no one wants to do. It can have injury. It's annoying. It's it's really a risk. It can also make the game go really bad if it doesn't work out. It's a risk. However, they know that at halftime, if they're this much behind, that it's probably their only hope that they're not catching up. It's their plan B. They come out, third quarter, make it happen, win or lose. And if it makes it happen, they're probably on track to get close to winning the game. If they don't, they were probably behind to lose it anyway, right? Plan B. Just kind of throw that in there. Oh, yes, ma'am. I just would say you got to set the expectations. Very yeah. few people come out and are going 100 miles an hour on Monday through Friday from eight to five. Right. Okay. So if I set my expectation, again, it's not it's not a meditated premeditated resentment because I'm, it's my own expectation. No person's responsible for me is me. If I set my goals right and I say I'm going to go 50 miles an hour Monday through Friday, eight to five every day, I might need to go 70 because I only went 40 on Tuesday. Or I might need to work Saturday because something happened Tuesday and that's not my day. You know? And honestly, nobody else will keep you accountable. No. Nobody. Like people we see we can find a possibility partner or you know, and that made it a coach, but they're not a, a, your coach, you're paying them five hundred dollars an hour and they're an eight. Okay. And you're talking to them once a week, you may can detect them here and there. Yeah, they they only want to work with the dogs, not someone they gotta hold their hands in time. Right. My attitude is for accountability. When you're dealing with accountability, it's not just an aspect of accountability. You got to create something that you can have that is your repercussion. So for sell by owners, real quick, I'll talk on this. As there's probably been less to sell by owners over the last couple of years, or if they came on, they went off quickly, right? Um, some market starting to shift things change there. Um, this is all I really want to interject with that. So What's the, what is for sell by owners, us as real estate agents, and clients that do list their house all have in common? They did have to pay $30,000, $60,000, $100,000 and more in commission. They probably would, right? Even us. So, what we do know as we get into the industry is the value that comes with that, right? So, portraying that value, right? And so, we have to be really good, really knowledgeable, and be able to bring that value in whenever we're working with sell by owners. Um, any of you guys happen to call for stuff by owners now? Is that something that's really seen much of these days? It's coming back in. It's coming back in. Yeah, so many people sat around the pool and thought they're all going to grab one. It's, yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. It would taper back out. It's hard to see the frustration. 
So yeah, and Amber made that important point yesterday on for sale by owners. A lot of times they priced it so high, thinking that they would get it and they got no attention, so they're just kind of coming down, coming down, coming down, right? And then now it's just getting worse for them because they were overpriced to begin with. Um, so okay, moving on. All right, protect your time. Um, any of you guys work at who works at the office? Any of you guys work in the office? Perfect. A couple of you guys. Any of you work from home? Okay. So there's distraction that boat, right? Not a church. I love it. You built a bunker, I bet. First one. It's spotted and nobody's allowed in there. Much just perfect. Exactly. And so many times we struggle with that. Carol. Amazing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right? You got 10 contacts, that make whatever it is. You have people you're going to be calling, so you can jump in, get it done, get it over with, move on, right? So um, for me, this wasn't working smart. Uh, this is how I did in the beginning. Got super successful that I just went through my phone, took all my contacts that I wanted to, to call my first day in, went down on a or had CRM or using it appropriately, just wrote them down on a paper, right? And I scratched them off as I did, right? So um, it was somewhat of a plan, not the best one. Now it's so easy with CRMs, so now you can tag it and make it that much um, that much easier, right? So um, having prioritizing your day. It's not on your schedule, it doesn't exist. Okay, hear that in bold. Um, so lead gen, lead follow up. Um, and so not only is it planning out your week ahead of time, I know that. At the end of the day, it's making those calls happen. For me personally, for me to get it done, it's best if I do that in the morning. All right, getting it out of the way. I'm not here to argue which way is the best and what's the best time to call. What I can say, there's a lot of people that are a lot wealthier than me that say over and over again that it's much better to get your calls done in the morning. And I think the part that they're bringing up, Gary Keller, multiple other people, billionaires said the same thing if you look at their schedule. They... What they really do well is get their biggest chunks out of the day. So Gary Keller says, I'm never slacking off until after 11 o'clock. I'm going to get everything I need done before 11. That has to be done, right? My priorities. My priorities. So for most people, um, their, their success comes from what they do first thing, first thing, right? So um, very, very huge. Um, another thing that we forget is, is we, you, were, you, were, you were in the New York Week's right? So what was one of the first things that you got your first thing? Schedule. Right? Had a schedule post. Yeah, yeah, assignment. assignment, your schedule, right? A lot of other careers, you have a schedule. We get into real estate and we forget that that exists. We might work 20 years in another industry where we had a schedule every day. We get into real estate and we, we just throw that out of the water. Make your schedule, right? Like what would, like Amber brought up, if you were working for yourself, would you keep yourself higher, right? What would you expect someone to do? Um, all right. I remember, did anyone write the one thing? The one thing? Yeah. I was thinking that, you know, yeah, I remember what they said about willpower. You are strongest in the morning to make decisions in your communication. And then as the day goes by, you start to wither. You're not as, you're not as on top of it. So the important things, when they get pushed to the end of the day, you know, I don't know about you, but me, this is at the end of the day, I mean, it takes a Herculean effort for me to actually get it done. It's, that's when I'm like, that will get tomorrow. And not rushing, right? If you, you can get it done, lots of the rush. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. If you're in a listing appointment or working with a buyer, you're not on your phone, checking your phone, checking your emails, right? We need to treat our time in our, our office where we're making our conversation as an appointment. You set those standards up with your clients. Hey, I'll be, if you call me this between this and this time, um, you know, and you can text them every day. I'll be in appointments. I'll call you back. If you can reach out to me, I'll call you back after one at between one and one third, right? Well, I just put all your IT when I did my presentation, I right, to include my schedule of children in presentation. And I say, you know what? I'm I'm treating my business like a business. You know, here I will contact you between this hour and this hour. And actually, people for the most part when I talk to you, they appreciate it. Yeah, they respect it. They respect it and they and they do look at sure as Another professional, not somebody that's gonna be there, you know. Yeah, no, that's huge. And and touching base on that, um, when you think about it this way, whenever you you bring your car in for service, if it's like taking longer than it should, you call in and they just say, Well, when 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 Bill comes back, <laughs> we'll uh we'll take care of. I don't know why I signed that name to the person in the service department. <laughs> but, uh so when Bill gets back, he'll make he'll he'll call you. I will 30 minutes later, hey, Bill back, Bill back and raise my car. Don't hear me. She says, Bill, Bill will call you between 4 and 4.30. Well, I'm patient until then. Now, 4.31 rolls around might be a different story. So it's setting those expectations up. Um, all right, next slide. Lead generation. So it's so what we've really been talking about was on actually making those things happen. So some people are heavy on internet leads. Some people are big on, you know, lots of different things. One thing I can say is if, you're, if you've got more time than you have money, you're going to really focus on being more prospecting based with marketing. That's your best way to get a return to begin with. Okay. And there's, you don't have to spend a lot of money to, to prospect. And even if you do have, you know, quite a bit of money and you have just a lot of time, you still want to really be on a more prospecting um, status. That's where you get your results. That's going to lead to um, most of the successes, right? Now, 
vice versa, if you get more uh, money than you have time, you're going to focus really in, uh, home in on who you're going to be prospecting for. You're not completely giving up prospecting by any means. You're just um, focusing on your prospecting differently. Maybe you're top 100, certain things, um, and you may be more marketing enhanced. Um, where you're, I mean, excuse me, maybe more prospecting against it, where you have more things to do other things, right? So now in the shift, Gary talks about going through, if you start going through a shift, everyone should really start focusing on being more prospecting. Um, so, so that's definitely important. Um, I know here it's a little different because in, in, I was just teaching this class for two weeks in DFW, where a lot of people that are there are from that area, so they have a huge network to begin with. A lot of you guys are moving in and out, right? So we're moving in from other areas. So one thing that's huge, and, and Team Thompson in Tampa, um, they really are doing so well with this. I was on some panels with them recently, the G2, G2 calls. So it's where you take your Mets, and I'll define what they call a Met. A Met is someone they know, someone that knows them, and someone they like or would enjoy their business. They don't like them, they don't put them. A lot of times we get confused. We just put everyone we've met somewhere as a met in our database, right? Get a little more clear on that so it's not overwhelming. Someone that I know, someone that knows me, and um, someone that I would want to do business with. Okay. Then they take those people and they do the DTV too. So I'm going to explain that real quick. So that's where it's, um, I believe KW came up with it. Other than not, they've really started promoting it over the last few years. It's where you've got 26 letters in alphabet, and half of that is 12. Kids, I'm saying 13. All right, there's 13 weeks in a quarter. And so you take two letters in the alphabet, it happens. Um, um, the two letters are based off of averages of people's names. So it's in the first letter of someone's name, the last letter, uh, and it's based on averages. So an M might be a lot of people with an M, and then very few people with a B. So they might be the two letters together, right? So it takes two letters in those alphabets, and that's who you're calling that week. So your N's or your B's, whatever it is, right? And so that 13 weeks, so that way you're calling your nets at least four times a year, goes back to that plan in place that we talked about. Now you've got a plan in your CRM, you get to work on right away on who to call. Okay. So you're touching them four times a year. Um, and you, um, you're getting so, so, and then they also, you know, a lot of times they only have, they have a skill where they're doing four attempts now before they will move on. So by Friday, they have answered, they should have called them four times. Try to call it, right? And they'll move on to the next week. They've seen their business. They were more like 50 50 between leads in and, and uh, personal database. They did more lead closings last year, and that was only 30% of business. They enacted for a year, past year, and they've seen their, their, their past client this year increase to 70%. And still with doing more internet leads and everything else as well. Their business is just almost double, right? And uh, they, do a, they do a very good business. So um, that's huge. That's something that really gets that plan in place, that organization. Um, and it's great. <laughs> yeah. And then following up, I mean, that's another one. I'll just throw that in there too. The failure typically is a follow up. Um, one way to really look at it is we talk about database and make things more difficult. In reality, you got to take your area, all right, Naples, Greater Naples, whatever that is. Okay. You got uh, people that you know and a much bigger number of people that you don't know, right? So we know through statistics, very, very real stuff, Max Coaching, Max Department at KW has done this research over and over. They know that if you barely communicate with your database, you're going to get about 2% return on that equipment. So if you've got 1,000 people in there, what's what would that be, right? So they, so about a 2% return, if you're just doing a minimal database. People that do it super, super well, they're getting a 10%. So 1,000 people, 100, right? So, um, Focus again on, uh, on so, so, you, so you want to take the people that you don't know, make them a man, put them in your, get them in your database, just in general for that reason. And then basically make it so confusing with all these tags, you're basically, you got a couple of buckets. You wanted to have, let's just say 24 closings in a year. You need to have six people at all times in bucket number one. 